Welcome to the Transformation Church Podcast, where we're leading people into a transforming relationship with Jesus. We hope this message inspires you, builds your faith, and gives you a fresh perspective on God and His Word so you can see transformation in your own life. Enjoy the message. Man, I'm excited about this. The whole time I'm watching it, I'm thinking of that song. I'm unstoppable. Okay, sorry. Just having my moment. Having my moment. Hey, if we've not met, my name is Mike. I'm the executive pastor of ministries here at Transformation Church. And man, welcome home. I'm so glad you're here with us today. If you're watching online from the beach or the mountains or whatever, hey, we're so glad that you've tuned in for Baptism Sunday. Wasn't that amazing? <laughs> Woo! I honestly felt like just whenever that video was on, I was just going to cannonball right in. You know what I mean? Like, I was so inspired. And everybody in this section would have never come back again, you know? Maybe the whole church would have felt a drop because it would have been a big cannonball. But, hey, I got a question for you today. I want to ask you a question. Anybody in the room humble enough to admit that you have a funny habit or quirk about you? Yeah, most of the people uh, who don't want to admit that, maybe they haven't ever had anybody tell them, hey, honey, or hey, brother, hey, sister, this is a funny little quirk that you have, right? It's good to have really close friends that keep you accountable. So I'm going to tell my wife's funny habit, and then I'm going to tell mine. I have permission to do this, so I will not be sleeping on the couch tonight. My wife's funny habit is when she uses American cheese singles, she leaves the wrapper on the counter. It's like a mental block that she doesn't know that those things go to the garbage. It's maybe the translucency. She just can't see them. I don't, I don't know. But she leaves them on the counter. And so I know when somebody had a ham and cheese sandwich at my house because there sits the wrapper. Mine is whenever I get frustrated, I always say the same words. I always say, I'm just saying. Well, duh, of course I'm talking, right? I'm just saying are the three words that I say when I'm getting frustrated. So if you walk by me and you hear me say, hey, I'm just saying, then I'm probably just having a moment. I just need God's grace, okay? I just need God's grace in that moment. But I think sometimes in our Christian faith, there are funny things that we do and we don't even know why we do them. Maybe they're not always funny. Maybe they're fun, you know, fundamental things that we do that we don't maybe even know why we do them. So here's some funny things, right? Christian language, Christian lingo, things that Christian people say. They're like, hello, brother in Christ. You know, okay, I'll be brother in Christ. Hey, sister of the most high God, good to see you today in the tabernacle of the holy God. Okay, it's, it's the church, but we're good. Yeah, we don't have to get all crazy. Another one, right? Um, if you're in a really churchy church, they don't say welcome to church today. They say, welcome to church on today, on today, right? It's like, yeah, not on tomorrow or not on yesterday, on today. Almost sounds like Santa, on today, on dancer, on prince, okay, on today. What about communion? Sometimes, you know, if you look at people take communion, some people take it like once a year, some people take it like every Sunday, some people take it every day. And you look at communion, and you're like, man, I know it says to do this in the Bible, but like, why bread and grape juice, right? I'm just one of those guys who loves that, probably where my seven-year-old gets it from. Why? Why do we do this this way? You know, and sometimes God's like, son, just read the Bible, okay? Stop asking why. But I think if we were really honest with ourselves, why do we baptize people? That's another question. Why do we fill up this lovely tank and we put a water heater in it by the second service? Y'all probably like, wait, hold on. We got robbed. There was not a water heater that kept this tank warm. Why do we go through the trouble of putting people in water and making them before the whole church profess their faith in Jesus and go underwater and come out of water? Well, today I kind of want to unpack this, but by before we hop into unpacking that, I want to talk about the two extremes that we see in culture about baptism. The first extreme is this. Eh, it's not a big deal. Baptism, pff, it's not a big deal. It's just a bunch of water that people share and they get in and they get out. It's not a big deal. And a lot of times, if you think that way, you begin to minimize that something Jesus actually emphasized. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. The second thing is you have the total far other side of the spectrum where some people say, well, baptism is salvation. If you don't go under the water and come out, you're not saved. 
terrible theology. <laughs> that is not true. Salvation, based upon Romans and several other citations in the Bible, is based upon the profession with our mouth and the belief in our heart that Jesus is Lord and that he died for our sins and went to a sinner's cross. And three days later, after laying in a tomb, he rose from the dead and was resurrected, that you and I might have life and life more abundant. That's salvation. Baptism is confirmation, is proclamation, is affirmation of all that God has done in our life. And so today I want to slow down and I want to talk about the bottom line of baptism. And I've, I've done this through a message that I've titled made new for more. You notice all the shirts said made new as people were being baptized because I believe that God makes us new for more than what we're living in. And the bottom line of baptism is simple. Baptism is about obedience. Baptism is about obedience. It's not about convenience and it's not about feeling like we've got to just, we just got to do it like a checklist option. It's about obedience. And I want to give us four reasons as to why we get baptized today in obedience to the Lord. The first one is this. So we can be made new in his example. Made new in his example. You see, when we're baptized, we are following the example and the commands of Jesus. Here's what I mean by that. Mark 1, verses 9 through 11, simply states, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee. Pause. Check it out. That's like 60 miles, y'all. <laughs> Jesus decided to go on a, a couple-day stroll from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. We're not going to go too far down this, but you'll notice that he's baptized by immersion, not sprinkling. Full immersion. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, meaning he was fully immersed, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love. And with you, I am well pleased. See, we're made new in his example when we're baptized. Because it's exactly what Jesus did. Imagine that day. Imagine that day. You're in line to be baptized. And right in front of you is Jesus, the Savior of the world. No pressure. Right? No pressure. You got Jesus in front of you in the baptism line. You got a sinner behind you and a sinner in front of him. And you got a sinner in you, right? And here's Jesus. And you're like, hey, bro. Man, your hair is going to get wet, bro. That's some nice flowing hair you got there, Jesus. Sweet beard, bro. Hey, man, like, what brings you to be baptized today? And he's like, yeah, no big deal, man. Just the son of God, you know, wanting to make an example for some, for, for my children, you know, imagine the pressure. And if, if anybody had a hall pass to not have to be baptized, it was Jesus because he was the son of God. He was the flawless and perfect lamb. He didn't need to prove or confirm or proclaim anything because he, his existence was the mere proclamation of our faith. But he said, hey, I, as the son of God, hold baptism important. And I'm going to humble and lower myself to a place of humility where I'm going to share the river with sinners. And I'm going to lower myself so I can show the importance and emphasize the importance of baptism. And when he did so, the father was pleased. You see, the father is pleased with us when we do anything that models and examples Jesus. The father says, hey, just as my good and faithful son, whom I was well pleased with, did that, I am well pleased with you who were baptized today. He's, when he's pleased with you, that means we're fulfilling the obedient step that Jesus took and modeled publicly like Jesus did. So we shouldn't minimize something that Jesus actually exercised. He actually did it. Many scholars believe, and if you read the text, it's pretty accurate, that Jesus' public baptism in water was the activation moment of his public ministry. It was in that moment when the heavens split and the dove ascended and said, uh, this is my son for whom I am well pleased. And then you begin to continue to read, and there are uh, miracle signs and wonders that Jesus performs from that day on. I'm not saying he wasn't already doing ministry in the silos on the side before he got baptized, but his public ministry began after his baptism was finished. But not only did it activate his public ministry, but we also see 
that right before Jesus ascended to be at the right hand of the Father, he told his disciples to do what? To baptize. So he, he exercised and he emphasized the importance of baptism. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So not only did he model baptism and emphasize it by his, his exercise, but he commands it to the disciples right when he is ascended into heaven to be at the right hand of the Father. He says, hey, the last thing I leave you with is go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was so important to him, it was his last words. It wasn't, hey, it's been fun, y'all. Thanks for the good time. Man, all those healings and stuff were legit. I'm so glad we could be a part. Deuces, and he ascends. No, he said, listen, make disciples, baptize them. Because he emphasized the importance of the exercising of baptism in his life. And being made new into the image of Christ and through the operation and the example of Christ is more than a tradition for you and I. It's a commission for you and I to step into the pool and make Jesus known. And to affirm our belief in Jesus. How, how do we do that? We're baptized in his name, which is our next idea. We're made new in his name. You see, when we're baptized and made new in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, we become made new. And when we're baptized, we proclaim that, that we believe his death, burial, and resurrection, and that he saves us from the toils of sin. It's a way to affirm the belief in Jesus in our lives. You see, our baptism is a physical representation of what Jesus did when he came and died on the earth. You see, our, our, our submersion represents his death. Our time in the water represents the three days that he laid in a borrowed tomb. And then we come out, it represents the resurrection that he left for you and I, so that you and I might have abundant life. See, the baptism was a physical representation. And when we do it in his name, we're partnering in action that could easily just be done out of action with the power of the name of Jesus that breaks bondage, that tears down yokes, that can move mountains, that can heal the sick. We say, in the name of Jesus, my deliverer, my healer, my comforter, in the name of that person, I am baptized today to be made new in his image and in his name. It's such a powerful depiction. I love how Romans 6, Paul writes and he says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we may too live a new life. Life, we may too be made new in Christ. When we're baptized in Jesus' name, we're representing and confirming our belief that Jesus died, that he laid in a borrowed tomb for three days, and then he rose and was resurrected so that we can live a life of power. See, baptism physically symbolizes the truth that we see in Paul's letter to the Corinthians as well. In 1 Corinthians, he says, for what I receive, I pass on to you for a, a, a first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Our baptism confirms that passage in 1 Corinthians saying, we truly believe by being baptized, the death of Jesus, the laying in the tomb, and the resurrection thereafter. And as we're baptized in his name, according to his example, we're proclaiming our belief in his sacrifice and that he gives us our next point, which is he gives us a future. Because when we're baptized, we're made new for our future. Made new for our future. See, when we're baptized 
and we're made new for our future, we're proclaiming that our own personal death to sin has happened. And that we're going to be buried in the cleansing power of Jesus. And that we will also, like Jesus, resurrect from the death of our sin into a purpose in a new life only that can be found in him. That passage in Romans states, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death? So we died with Christ in that moment as we went under the water. We're therefore buried in him as we were under the water through the baptism into death in order to just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too may be raised to a new life only found in him. You see, this tank, friend, this is our water grave. This is our water grave. This is where we come and say, I have a future that goes beyond my present. I have a future that goes beyond my fear. I have a future that goes beyond my sin. And today I choose to take those things that are, that are binding me, that Paul calls the momentary afflictions, and I choose to bury them and drown them in the water of the tomb of Jesus so that I could be raised to life like Christ did the third day, and I could have a future in him that can only be assured and affirmed through his death. I love how Galatians 2 says it. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live for me, but Christ lives in me. I now live in the body, and I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself as a sacrifice for me. Baptism is just another way of affirming that Jesus gave himself for you and for I. And our plunge in this water propels us to walk in a purpose in a future that can only be found in Christ. And not from our desire or our preference or because it looks good on photo or so that our families can come and clap. And those are all important things. But the most important thing is that so we can be propelled to a purpose in a future that only can come and a proclamation of our faith in Jesus. And it's not for our glory or for our significance or for our, our, uh, our affirmation. It's for his fame, which leads me to the last idea today, which is when we're baptized, we are made new for his fame. Not for ourselves, not for our name, not for our agendas, not for our our heart's desires, because if we're in alignment with Jesus, our heart's desires will follow his heart's desire. And his heart's desire for us is that we would be a vessel for him. Here walking amongst the earth, seated with him, proclaiming his name in all that we do. And when we're baptized, we're proclaiming his name to all who see the life change that follows. Listen, when I was baptized, I held off. So I was sprinkled as a baby. I went way left in my life. I went crazy. I lost my mind, started sinning, got addicted to drugs, started making terrible decisions in my life, started drinking, partying every weekend. But there was a moment that happened where I decided I was going to go all the way in. And I could not wait to be baptized in that moment. You know why? Not because I wanted to be, you know, confirmed before the church and the Lord that I had finally quit running from his call for my life. No, so that I would have an opportunity like the, in total today, 18 people who have gone through this tank to say, I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was broken, but he is my healing. I was addicted and I was bound but he's my chain breaker. I wanted the chance to tell people in my hometown that knew me intimately to say, hey, this isn't, I'm not playing games. God did something in my life and I'll never be the same. So listen, we're, we're excited and we're so thankful for the 18 people who got baptized in both services today. Like we're excited and we love that and we celebrate them. And if you can't tell, we do baptisms big here at TC. We get loud, we get rowdy, we play music, we have the fog machine. It's just a party, man. It's like Jesus, right? We're partying, baby. We're here to party. But let me tell you, 
We didn't just do that for them, for the people getting baptized, which we did, because that's important. But that's the second priority. The first priority is we did that to celebrate all that God has done. 18 lives, never the same. That's why we do this, and that's why we do it big. Because baptism is a declaration of moving from the shame of sin into an unashamed love for the one who gave it all that we would have life and life abundant. There's a transition that happens in this tank. And we celebrate that. We celebrate that moment. It's a step of saying, Lord, I'm no longer ashamed. I want everyone to know in front of hundreds of people and people watching online and in my workplace when I wear my made new t-shirt and all this, I want people to know that I'm all in. I'm not playing games anymore. I'm not dating you anymore, Lord. I marry my life to you. It reminds me of when my wife and I got engaged and we got married. This year will be 14 years of marriage. 14 years. Yeah. This year I officially um, am in my family tree. I'm one of the longest marriages in my family tree. 14 years. We'll be one of the longest marriages. So like, I don't say that from pride. I say that because I, uh, I, when I said, Lord, I'm all in for you, I'm breaking generational curses for you. Um, and you're going to have to help me because I can't do it on my own. But I forget when I proposed to Christina, we had been dating for a couple months. I knew she was the one. I had her come to the church. I set some lights up on the platform and she walked over to the platform. I was standing there and I had a ring pop. I said, Hey, hold this ring pop. And she held it and looked at us. I said, you just inspect it. I'm going to do a magic trick. And so I'm like, all right, give it back to me. I want you to watch. I'm going to take this ring pop. I'm going to do a magic trick. I'm going to cover it up. Then I want you to close your eyes. So she closed her eyes. And I threw it behind me and I grabbed a diamond out of my pocket and I hit one knee. I said, okay, open your eyes. And she opened her eyes and I'm there on one knee. And I said, here's the deal. I'm not going to be perfect, but I promise to give you everything I got. And I sat there and I cried like a baby. A couple months later, yes, we had a microwave marriage. It happened quickly. <laughs> Boom. We got married like three, four months later because I didn't want to wait. A couple months later, she's walking on the aisle. She's thinking gorgeous. Like, I look like a fool in our wedding pictures. Her mom made me shave my facial hair. Um, Michelle, if you're watching, please don't be mad at me. Um, but we're all just boogers in tears, right? Crying our eyes out. Uh, I didn't eat at my reception because I was just having so much fun high-fiving people, loving on people. I mean, we have so many great memories. Went to McDonald's in our wedding garb. Went on a honeymoon. It's been incredible. But at that altar, when I said I do, she slipped a ring on my hand and I slipped the second ring on hers. And that ring is a symbol. Check it out. I can leave that ring on my nightstand, but I'm still married. But when I wear that ring, it's saying, I'm married and I'm unashamed of what God partnered me with, which is an amazing woman. Listen, bap baptism is like a wedding ring. You can give your life to the Lord and say, God, it's all yours. This life is all yours. I surrender my ways and my will to yours. And baptism is, is, is the way of putting a ring on it and saying, you know what? I am proudly pronouncing to the world today that I'm unashamed that God changed my life. I'm unashamed that I've been made new, not for me, but for his glory and for all that he has placed on my life in the future and the purpose in his name, I am made new. It's a wedding ring moment for the bride of Christ. This is how Paul wrote it to the, the Galatian church. He said, so in Christ, you're all children of God. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed in Christ. You go into the tank. And you proclaim all that God has done in your life. You come out of the water and you've been clothed in righteousness to proclaim to the far ends of the earth all that God has done for you. I love how the message translation it reads. It says, but now that you're at your destination by faith in Christ, you're in direct relationship with God. Your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start. It also involved dressing you in an adult faith wardrobe, which is a wardrobe of Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's promise for you. 
It's a fulfillment of a promise that God made. Why? Because baptism isn't just a demonstration of our faith. It's a deployment of His fame. It's a way for us to come out of that water and say, no longer I, but Christ in me, the hope of glory I will live for. I will share to the outer parts of the earth. I've made my my public declaration and I'll continue to do so. Made new for His fame in all that we do. I love how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, therefore, we are now ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us, the church, saved and baptized in his name. So we must be careful that we don't minimize something that Jesus and God himself have emphasized. And that we become made new in his example, in his name, for our future, for his fame. Be made new to step out and proclaim Jesus to the outer parts of our workplaces, our school campuses, sports teams. All the the facets of our life would permeate from a public proclamation that's made when we go down a dirty center and come up a child of God. So maybe today you're in this room and you're like, Pastor Mike, I've I've been saved for 800 years. Congratulations, you're still alive. But maybe you've always just minimized baptism as some ritual. And I want to encourage you. It's not a ritual. It's an opportunity to make Jesus known and your story available to others who might be struggling. Don't you love that scripture that says we have overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony? Notice the word we there. Maybe the testimony that you share from this tank could be someone else's overcoming moment. Don't write off something that God's trying to write into your story. Maybe you've been saved just for a couple of months or days. Maybe you got saved last Sunday. Maybe you've been giving your life to, maybe you watched a podcast on the way to work this week and you gave your life to Jesus on I-10. Now's the time. Now's the time. And we're trying to make it as easy as possible on the tap dot on the seat in front of you or at the next steps desk. We have our next registration for baptism open or receiving baptism candidates. And we slapped a date on it because you have to. Our database makes us put a date on that registration. But we may, just, we may just have a wild hair and set up and do a baptism in, in the parking lot in the next couple of weeks if people are like, hey, what do I need to do to go public with my faith and proclaim the fame of Jesus through the life change that has happened in me? So I encourage you, take, take that step. When's the best time to be baptized? Now, if you've not been baptized. But maybe there's just a couple of people in this room today who have listened to this whole idea of being made new for Jesus and you desperately want that for your life you know what the coolest thing about Jesus he doesn't expect you to show up clean that's his job he wants you to show up willing and maybe you've been going through life and you saw some of these testimonies and you're like I wish that was my story Maybe you hear us talking about being made new into a future and a purpose that is full of life and love and joy. And you see the joy that's in the face and the hearts of the people in this room. You're like, I need to be made new like that. We don't always do this this way in service, but I think today is the day that you can choose to be made new before the sight of Jesus. I've I've never in my life seen a man take a dirty cloth which was my life, and dip it in red blood, which is the blood that he shed for you and I, and pull it out, and it's white as snow. I've never, that doesn't make any sense to me, but it makes faith in me to know that God is faithful. And he can be faithful for you just as he was faithful for me. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's message, be sure to share it with your friends and tag us at TransformTLH. Thanks again for listening, and we look forward to seeing your face in the place someday. Have a great week.